please give a hand in welcoming Gary Bell. Uh, it's great to be here today with you guys. Uh, out of all that, you know, listen to all that history, you know, it just takes me back that uh, I just graduated from here near, so like <coughs> 27 years ago, something like that. So uh, um, it's, it's really great to be back on campus and see all the improvements. And I'm super excited to see so many people that would brave the weather to come hear me talk about blockchain which is uh, that's a, that's a sign that we're all headed in the, in the right direction, I think. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the Beta, Psi, Beta Alpha Psi Honor Society and the Blockchain Student Society for having me today. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Warren uh, for uh, liaisoning with me to, to make this happen. Um, when, when I was here, uh, I was very interested in uh, the law, which you know I, I went on to, to kind of focus most of my career in. And, and Dr. Uh, Tony Mulvaney, who I don't see here just yet, but she was uh, she was our faculty sponsor for the Pre-Law Society. We did a bunch of stuff in this very room. Spent a lot of time at the, the Gray Library, uh, doing moot court competitions, and traveled all over the state, uh, having fun. So. Uh, so the, the, the Lamar period of my life is, is very fond memories and uh, was very much instrumental in, in sending me in the trajectory that I ultimately went into. As I was preparing for today, I was reminded of this uh, quote from Steve Jobs. Uh, he gave a commencement speech shortly before he passed away at Stanford University. If you haven't seen it, I would strongly encourage you to go check it out on YouTube. But um, I think it's it's appropriate for kind of me being back at, at Lamar um, and, and thinking about what things were like as I was looking ahead to my future, uh, not really knowing, as you don't, as you look forward, how things are going to turn out, but when you're now here looking back at the trajectory of, of your life and the various things that you you went on to do, um, it, it was it was uh, it's appropriate statement. So he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something. Your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever it is. Uh, and this approach has never let me down, and it's made all the difference. So I'll take you back in time a little bit, tell you a little bit about me and kind of how I traversed through my kind of education or early part of my life. Um, that, how that led to my, my legal career uh, and ultimately stumbling into this thing called the, the blockchain industry. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Val Hill and then we'll talk about uh, tokenization uh, and, uh, and, and blockchain technology. 35 years ago, uh, I was a musician and I had no interest in business or accounting or anything that was kind of like, you know, what adults do. Uh, I was in several bands, played all over, all over Texas. I ended up, as was mentioned, going to a recording arts school in Florida called Full Sail Center for Recording Arts and was one of like, maybe the second graduating classes there. Uh, I got an associate's degree in audio engineering. I uh, had some friends that, that uh, we, we did studio work with and played around with at the Full Sail that ended up going out to Los Angeles. And I had no clue as I graduated what I was going to be doing. And so I ended up on the phone with one of my buddies and he said, hey, why don't you, why don't you come out to Los Angeles? I think I can get you a job at, as a runner. And for those of you who don't know what a runner is, that basically meant that I was a professional uh, sweeper and latte acquirer and uh, you know from time to time I would get to go into a studio and you know fill someone's cup of coffee or something like that but that's that's basically what I started out doing um, what was interesting about that time though was as I got more and more adept at engineering we, we had a sound effects business we were doing on the side we actually invented some technology that we call virtual post and marketed that uh, to some sound, uh, I guess, 
post-production facilities in Los Angeles, um, but we were basically had the state-of-the-art computer systems at that time. We had these amazing Apple Quadra computers. This is one of them right here. The thing stood up about like this high. And the other cool thing we had, Nicole, uh, the other, it's my uh, former family member there. Um, so the other thing we had, this is, you know, 90, 91, is we had the internet. And uh, no one else really knew what the internet was back then. Uh, but we would go to meetings in LA um, and be telling about our virtual post technology and stuff. And one of these, you know, producers or some executive would be like, oh, I think, you know, JPL would be interested in that. Or I think, you know, this company would be interested in it. I, I mean, I was like 19 and had no clue who, who these companies were. We would go back home, and if you had mentioned four companies, we'd pull those companies up on the internet and print out a report, which, you know, at that time, Hoover's business profiles was free to users of America Online. So we'd pull these reports, and uh, if you had mentioned four companies in our meeting on Wednesday, we would show up Thursday with a, a, effectively the four analyst reports, and these people's minds were blown because they were like, you'd have to hire an investment bank. To, to do this work, and how did you guys do it basically overnight? Of course, we didn't tell them anything. We're going, like, eh, you got the internet at home. You don't, you don't use this stuff. So um, the other thing that I think made me very aware as kind of my journey started to venture into blockchain was digital audio itself and kind of knowing how uh, these, these various samples were taken. This is a, a digital audio wave. And you know, you, you basically the, you're taking a snapshot of each point of this wave, and that's how you're you're creating it. Now, if you were to play that through a speaker, this would sound horrible. It'd be like <laughs> that, that type of sound. But what they do is they error correct between these two points in time, and they end up smoothing out that wave. So, kind of being in digital at a very early age, having access to the internet, you could say that my my eyes were open and I was aware that technology was a very powerful thing that could change a lot. Unfortunately for me at that time, I didn't know that much about business. I hadn't gone to Lamar University yet. Um, and so what I probably should have been doing was taking some of that money and actually investing it in these companies and all that. And who knows, we'd maybe have a different conversation now. But, um, you know, life, life marched on and um, I couldn't stand Los Angeles. I was there probably during the worst time to live in Los Angeles. I was there when uh, the, the riots occurred, the Rodney King riots occurred in 92. Uh, the Northridge earthquake happened, which was one of the largest earthquakes, I think, in LA's history. Um, there was uh, major forest fires. There was always forest fires in California, but there was one that completely wiped out Malibu and then when the rain season came in the spring, there was these massive mudslides and so when I was there, a young, you know, a young man from Beaumont, Texas, watching all this stuff go down, things felt quite apocalyptic to me. So I'm like, you know, I got to get out of here. Um, I started dating a, a girl around that time, and she and I decided that we would move to Nashville and try or try to look in Nashville. So we moved to Nashville, where I spent, I don't know, 10, 11 months. Uh, and uh, I was on, you know, the phone with my parents. It was like, I really would like to maybe go to college. And we're like, we, well, you, you need to, you know, come back to Texas if, if we're going to be able to help you out at all. Um, so I ended up moving back to Texas, and my dad uh, had a relationship with someone you guys may know, um, Dr. Jimmy Simmons. At that time, Dr. Simmons was the dean of the music school. And I guess they had seen each other at some restaurant, some local restaurant, and, uh, and you know, my dad was like, my son really needs to talk to somebody, would you mind visiting with him about kind of his, his current career choices and stuff. At the time, I thought, you know, I may go to college, but <clears throat> even if I do, I'll probably go get a music performance degree, be a producer, something like that. Um, but I, I came to campus one day to meet with Dr. Simmons. And it's one of those meetings that going into it, you know, because this is a completely objective person, he has no skin in the game about what he's not my parent, he's not my grandparents or something. So he's going to say some stuff to me. 
and I'm going to have to listen to them because it's going to be probably good advice. So that was my attitude going in, and um, sure enough, Dr. Simmons heard my story, and I'd been you know, in L.A. and Nashville, and he said, well, he said, if you were my son, I'd tell you to get a four-year degree, because, you know, people with four-year degrees make about 30% more on average than people without one. He said, and then I'd tell you to go back to Los Angeles or Nashville and, uh, you know, kind of just keep doing what you were doing. Well, that was, like, horrible. You know, because I was like, oh, I don't want to do what I was doing. That's why I'm here in the first place. So within a month or six weeks after, I enrolled at Lamar University and, uh, and started taking classes here. And one of my first semester, I took a principles of accounting course. And um, I don't know where this came from, but I'm sitting there, and we were going over the balance sheet or something like that. And, Everybody's kind of shouting out answers. I'm like, no, no, you credit this, you debit, blah, 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 you drop that in owner's equity, and, that's, and everybody's looking at me like, how do you know this? I'm like, I don't know. Well, it turns out I had an aptitude for accounting, and finance, and capital structure, and things like that. So um, I ended up really just throwing myself into, into business. It was this whole new, you know, kind of green, greenfield area for me. Uh, spent when I wasn't, you know, working on school work and I, I since I was older I had this a lot of pressure I wanted to um, you know get out of school as, as quickly as possible and start making money um, so I, I, I take like 21 hour semesters we had these uh, winter and spring sessions they still have that where it's like a month you can get three hours or something so I was doing all that um, and uh, I, I as I developed that interest in law I, um, I figured, well, I need to work at, at a law firm, figure out what this is about. So I became a file clerk at um, Mahaffey Weber here in town and was filing. For, I, I got lucky. I ended up uh, filing for most of the corporate lawyers there. Uh, so that's how I really started to get interested in doing corporate work. But uh, when I, it, when the free time I had, I would go to the library and uh, basically get into the accounting section and start kind of marching up and down and just pulling books and reading a lot of business biographical type stuff. So that's when I started reading about uh, KKR's takeover of RJR Nabisco. And uh, would read about Mike Milken and uh, you know the, the high yield bond craze and how they were using it to finance takeovers of casinos and major public companies and stuff. And I would just sit there and almost dream about must be so cool to be in those conference rooms doing these mega high finance deals. Um, and and you know, I could kind of just see myself doing that. So I really started developing interest in mergers and acquisitions. And by the time I, I graduated, I was either going to go straight into investment banking or, um, or um, become a corporate lawyer to do M&A. I ended up Dr. Warren and I were talking about this. I applied for the, uh, the Joint Lamar Texas Tech School Law Scholarship, and I ended up getting it. And that really made all the difference. If I, if I would not have gotten that scholarship, I probably wouldn't have gone to law school. I'd have gone into work for a little while and then maybe pursued an MBA path. But um, I ended up uh, doing that, and I got, I got to Texas Tech. Uh, kind of being very focused on learning corporate work, uh, learning about securities, and I would call um, I would call the various corporate law firms in Texas. I knew I, I wanted to be in Texas. I didn't want to go back to it. At that time, if you um, if you want to do M and A, you really had to be in New York. Um, and, and even though there was some of that work in Texas, it wasn't considered something that you could really specialize in. So um, I um, ended up uh, calling, so I was calling around like Vincent Elkins and Baker Bossy's major corporate law firms and, and around the state. And I would get all these partners and they'd be like, you know, so you want to do M&A? And I was like, yeah, I want to do M&A. And they're like, well, I don't know. I was like, why don't you just try to be a good corporate lawyer? You know, it's like, well, I don't want to just do corporate work. I want to do M&A. So, you know, kept, kept going, kept going. Uh, I ended up getting recruited uh, out of law school uh, by Winstead, which is a regional Texas law firm. <coughs> People know that they've never heard of Winstead. Uh, 
and I hit Winstead uh, at a really cool time because uh, we were representing the Houston Texans on their naming rights deal for uh, what was Reliance Stadium, the Pastro Domain complex at the time. Uh, another really cool uh, deal that I got to work on was um, we represented Pastor Joel Osteen and his bid for Compact Center, which is now Lakewood Church on 59. Uh, it was near and dear to my heart because uh, you know Compact Center had been the summit, and that's where you had to go if you wanted to see a rock concert. You lived in Beaumont, you had to you know go to Houston, go to the summit. So I'd seen Van Halen and Ozzy Osbourne and all these. You know, rock, rock bands at, at the summit. So, um, trying to think if I should digress. I'll tell you this one little story. Um, so, <clears throat> the way I got that work was I was the fool, kidding, who was there at like 6.30 on a Friday. And everyone else in the corporate department was gone. And I was working away. And um, Dennis Bram, who went on to become CEO of the firm, frantically goes running down the hall and he goes right by my office because i'm a i've been there i don't know five months like he doesn't know anything so he's looking for someone more senior uh and then he, he almost moonwalks back because i'm the only person there and he looks in he's looking at my name he's like, it's like jimmy and i'm like yes sir and he's like can you be at a, a meeting at 7 15 a.m on monday morning i'm like sure you know, so he's like, okay, we've just been engaged by Lakewood Church and they want to make a bid for Compact Center. Like, that sounds cool. So that's how I got on the deal. Second thing that happened was uh, we ran um, uh, basically title exceptions for Compact Center and to, to see what type of encumbrances. Uh, it was an interesting history of Compact Center. Uh, it had been developed uh, by a, a gentleman named Kenneth Schnitzer, who developed that whole Greenway Plaza mm -hmm. office complex uh, in, in that area right off of 59. And he had given the land that the summit and the compact center was sitting on to the city to be used as an entertainment type venue. And the number so, and he had some deed restrictions when he basically granted that, that land over. And the first one, number one, was shall not be used as a church. I was like, oh, I think that's a problem, you know. So I go walking down with my file and put it in front of Dennis. I said, uh, so it says right here uh, we, we, we can't use it as a, as a church. He's like, you're kidding. I'm like, no. That's a problem, right? Because it's Lakewood Church. He's like, yeah, it's a problem. So for the first, uh, I don't know, year we referred to it in all of our bid documents to the city and all that stuff is Lakewood International Center. And it was going to be an educational center. It wasn't going to be a church. There's a whole other back stuff about what happened with that that I won't, I won't bore you with. But I ended up getting recruited uh, from Winstead um, by a firm called Jones Day. Mm -hmm. Jones Day is a major um, uh, international law firm. I think at the time I was there, it was something like 2,500 lawyers all over but they were one of these firms that I'd been reading about in these mega deal books that I'd been reading when I was at, at Lamar. And I knew that they had a very healthy M&A practice and did a lot of M&A. So I was like, if I, if I work there, I'll probably get you know to do some stuff. That might. A big thing then was, I just want to do a deal that makes the newspaper. Like, if I can do a big deal that makes the newspaper, that'd be really cool. So um, I went over to Jones Day after I'd been practicing a year and a month. And you know, pretty much got what I wanted. Uh, they worked me. Uh, there was, they used to call it Jones Day nights and weekends back in the day, and that's pretty much was my life for the next mm, 10, 12 years. Um, I made partner Jones Day uh, in uh, 2010, and then uh, moved to Paul Hastings. Um, it, at Jones Day is when I did the Continental deal, did the OG and &E deal. Um, I was stacking up a pretty healthy resume of, of transactions. Went to, went to Paul Hastings because uh, they wanted to do, like they wanted to have a mega energy m and practice. And so they basically recruited me to, to run that practice. And uh, the next six years were, were amazing. I did a ton of public to public deals in the uh, energy space. I developed a specialty in, in what's called master limited partnerships, which were publicly traded partnerships take advantage of a certain exception, the natural resources exception. Do you, do you guys do any publicly traded partnership 
lectures or anything here? Mm -hmm. Natural resources. It, it's it's a it's a unique thing in the tax code that allows for um, a partnership, the entity, to not pay entity level tax but still be public, so they can raise money from from retail. So developed a specialty in that, um, and. Uh, this continued on. I, I, I ended up going over to Winston Strong to also do their M&A uh, practice, and that's when the pandemic, you know, hits in 2020. Uh, so everything, as you all recall, um, you know, completely kind of shut down, and it was probably <laughs> the first time I'd had in my career to to sit back and just look at other stuff, think for a little bit, and. Um, you know, I was, in 2020, I was going to turn 50 that year. I'd always wanted to, you know, um, be a principal investor in these business deals and, and kind of, you know, be the, the driver of, of those types of things. So um, it seemed like a good time to, um, to, to launch Val Hill properly. So Val Hill was actually uh, coined by my mother. In the late 70s, there was a, a big boom in the oil and gas business, and Texas benefited quite substantially from that. And my mother started doing some um, uh, investment deals with her family members, and everybody needed to have a special purpose entity that was kind of their entity to invest in. So she came up with the name. Valley was my, my father's name, and my, my uh, maternal family is, is the Hill family, so she took the two names, put them together, and it's called Val Hill. Uh, and then once I became an attorney, um, my mother and I started buying some single family homes and, and fixing them up and leasing them, predominantly here in Beaumont. Uh, and we decided to use Val Hill as the, the name of that, that company we were doing those investments. So I always loved the name. It was really more appropriate for me in any way because I am kind of that merger of Valley and Hill. Um, so I actually started Val Hill Capital in 2005 as just a very passive entity. It's kind of, you know, when I wasn't working on law and stuff like that, I'd be doing um, uh, these deals and um, uh, for, you know, helping friends do some transactions, doing some corporate advisory stuff, that type of thing. We, uh, we ended up acquiring our first company. In 2016, we acquired a, a, a company called Mastic Masters, which was kind of a concrete services business in, in Houston. Uh, we've had fitness business for uh, um, my, my daughter ended up uh, starting a yoga studio in uh, November of 2019, so six months before the pandemic hit, and no one could go to the yoga studio anymore. Um, but we. Basically, I was stepping off the law path and starting to do these, um, these you know, more individually directed type transactions and, and build Val Hill. And it was during that time that I started to take a real close look at what was happening in the macro economy. It was clear to me, based on kind of what was happening towards the end of my legal career, and you know, this is the, the time of zero interest rates. Uh, the, the, the printers, you know, at the Federal Reserve is going crazy. Tons of money uh, being put out in the market. It was it was kind of kind of clear to me that at some point we're going to have to have some reckoning or have a major change in the way the financial system worked. And that is when I really started for the first time to seriously look at this thing called blockchain. Um, so I. I heard about Bitcoin before I was telling the story earlier. Uh, I had a client uh, who was a, a, a CFO of a midstream company who in 2017 uh, calls me on the phone. He's like giddy because uh, he's invested in this Bitcoin thing. And he's like, and he's like, I'm making so much money and it's crazy. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? It's like weird internet money you're, you're involved in. And, He's like, yeah, he's like, my wife's telling me I should sell it. I was like, I think you should listen to her. You should get rid of all that. Uh, so uh, I was that guy. I was that conservative, not seeing blockchain at all until this 2020 time period. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I think this is going to create an opportunity to basically move the financial system to being all digital for real. So I read the 
the Bitcoin white paper. So has, that, has everybody read the Bitcoin white paper here? Yeah. Yeah. You should, if you have any interest in, in blockchain at all, you, you should read it because that's, that's where this whole thing kind of begins. Uh, but in 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto, who's unknown to, <laughs> to, to the world, uh, published this white paper and started uh, mining and doing transactions with, with Bitcoin. Uh, which now is a you know, major thing, right? Um, started, we, we, we did our first Bitcoin investment in uh, March. It was probably two weeks after um, uh, the pandemic kind of went mainstream and the lockdowns started to happen. Um, so there had been quite a substantial fall off in the market for all assets, the stock market, everything. So. We, we got Bitcoin around six thousand dollars, I think, something like that, and ended up doing pretty well with, with Bitcoin. Uh, but if you started to use it, certainly from my perspective of being a business person who had, you know, sent wires and, and saw how you know the plumbing of business works for, for a lot of accounting firms and things like that. For me, it was just too clunky and slow. You had the environmental issues with the energy consumption and things like that it just didn't seem like as this played out kind of like the internet played out it wasn't going to be the thing that was scalable and could be what the entire global financial system runs on so we started looking at other alternatives and it didn't take us too long to start finding what we refer to as kind of your ISO 20022 tokens or XRP, XLM, things, things like this. So once, once we used uh, XRP and you saw that it settled in three to five seconds, you know, it cost a fraction of a penny to, to do a transaction. Um, my creativity really kind of took off about how significant this was gonna be for plumbing businesses and changing you know, a lot in our, in our financial system. So I think I skipped through, so that's point paper. As, as, we, uh, as we started moving through 2020, we developed a relationship with the Texas Blockchain Council out of, out of Dallas. Um, you know, this is at a time not a ton of people, certainly professional people weren't really involved in this industry. So it was, it was really cool for us to, to find these other people like Lee Bratcher, uh, who's the founder of the Texas Blockchain Council, who was kind of doing his thing. We ended up uh, becoming a sponsor of the Texas Blockchain Summit in 2021. Uh, so we kind of had all that done. We were doing marketing and things like that. And about two weeks before the show, we ended up getting a call from um, a, a company called C Entertainment. And they wanted to do an NFT live at the Texas Blockchain Summit. And they were calling us to see if we might be interested in underwriting it. And it was like, NFTs, they're so like, last half of the year, you know, it's not gonna be a thing anymore. So, uh, wasn't really that interested. I started kicking it around with a friend of mine in Houston named Jim Rao, who runs a uh, boutique investment bank called Intoro. And we kind of came up with the idea of, let's take the, the smart contract and start wiring in economic rights to it like it's a security. Everyone is kind of running away from the securities laws and, and trying, you know, for, for these things not to be securities. Let's lean into it and actually start taking advantage of this technology. So that's how we became the first underwriter of an NFT securities offering in history. Uh, we did that deal. It was about eight days. It was um, economically very unsuccessful. And, uh, but we, we learned a ton and uh, really started working closely with developers uh, and, and uh, that whole thing. It was a ton of work, just like, like the old deals had been. Um, but what we really learned, it, we, we, we turned this thing into a circus. We had, um, you know, we, we partnered, the, the artist's name is a Cuban-American artist named Rolando Diaz out of Dallas, brilliant artist, Christian artist. and. Um, he painted uh, something called, he called it Sail Me to the Moon uh, up on stage. We had 
some young in Toro investment bankers sitting out uh, as if it was like golf commentary coming. Kind of, and now the stroke has gone up, and now it's down, and that kind of stuff, you know, and like golf clapping type stuff. So, um, <laughs> despite all of our, you know, <laughs> weak marketing efforts, you know, it, it wasn't really that great other than, you know, we were kind of the first to, to, to go off in that direction. We, we ended up, uh, you know, we, we guess you could say from, from our uh, study of the, the SEC, uh, the Ripple lawsuit. So in December 2020, uh, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission sued a company called Ripple which is really the primary steward of XRP and the XRPL, uh, claiming that they had been engaging in unregistered securities offerings by issuing these XRP since 2013, something like that. And, you know, it immediately hit, hit us wrong. Uh, first of all, we had done probably several months of due diligence on XRP before we'd ever bought it. So there was stuff out there like, FinCEN had settled with Ripple in uh, 2015, and in their statement of facts, they had declared XRP to be a virtual currency, not a security. Uh, you had legal analysis out there by people like uh, Chris Key and Carlo, who I think was a Wilkie Farr partner at, at the time, that they had written Howey test analysis, coming to the conclusion XRP was not a security. Uh, we had done our own analysis, uh, so just hours and hours and hours of, of looking into this, and then when the SEC sued Ripple, the chairman of the SEC, a guy named Jay Clayton, and um, several of the, some of the enforcement lawyers who actually brought the case, they left the SEC the very next day. Uh, they conveniently retired and basically left the crap sandwich for you know, other people at the SEC to deal with, which was highly irregular uh, for, for that type of event to happen. So kind of immediately suspicious about it. We, uh, we, we followed the case very closely. We participated in the, the, the first conference call uh, that, that Judge Netburn had. She was a magistrate judge who's basically managed most of the case. But uh, we've, we've been very closely following, very closely involved um, in, in, the, in the Ripple case. At, at one point, um, does anybody know who John Deaton is? No? John Deaton is a, you know who John Deaton is? All right, cool. Um, John Deaton's an attorney uh, out of Maryland um, who um, ended up in the days after um, uh, the SEC sued Ripple, he filed a motion to intervene on behalf of people like us who are kind of your retail uh, token holders of XRP. And uh, he was not allowed to do that, but he ended up uh, amassing a class of about 75,000 people all over the world who had been adversely impacted by, by the actions. So um, we were one. And so we developed a, a close relationship with, with, with John. Um, we were interviewed by Ripple's counsel in connection at one point. It was like I was going to do a deposition in the case to talk about kind of how we had gotten into it and everything. Um, but we ended up um, filing an amicus brief ourselves uh, for Valuable Capital. Uh, in November of 22, and went back to my old firm, Winston and Strong. They uh, they helped us write it up. So the cool thing about this is that uh, now that the summary judgment order has come out, Valvo Capital is actually in the listing of amicus brief writers. So we're kind of preserved in history in the watershed case of digital assets, which is. We uh, later pulled together a group of uh, investment bankers and accountants and financial professionals and did what, to my knowledge, is uh, the only effort that's been done for digital assets at all, which we did a comprehensive approach to determine the fair market value of XRP, where we basically took all the traditional types of valuation metrics like discounted cash flows, collateralization models, we ended up having a, a um, a biologist from South Africa get involved in this who came up with like an ecosystem uh, uh, model that actually, this one was the most fascinating, was Dr. Dion Bacchus. Um, when you took his, his 
inputs to his model and actually put in the volume and the pricing and stuff like that that it was happening. This is like in February of 23, I think. It actually did spit out the exact price of XRP. So his model kind of among the group was, was the most validated. But we published this in, uh, I think, the summer of last year. And this has gotten us tons of notoriety and doors open, a lot of criticism. Uh, but out of this, we ended up developing a relationship with Cornell Tech, which is kind of the master's program for, for Cornell. Um, we worked with some of their graduate students to come up with technology that could do um, valuations of digital assets. So that was a fun project. Developed a relationship with the Digital Asset Innovation Council out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, basically one of the, the founding members of that industry group. It's like a Texas blockchain council type of thing. And we want to take chapters and make that go national. So probably the first two chapters will be Houston in Atlanta. Uh, and then, you know, just kind of be rolling that out. Uh, and then, you know, the business started to come. So uh, last year we were engaged by a real estate group out of California called Park Street to uh, advise them on their tokenized securities offering for a project in Tuscany. It's a Gary Player golf course uh, resort and spa, there's villas, and uh, they're raising equity through a tokenized securities offering. Um, that is probably going to go live at the end of this month. And then we've also been engaged, I don't have a press release for it because we haven't done one, but uh, been engaged by a, a real estate exchange platform out of Florida that is really cutting edge. Um, and we are going to be assisting them in doing tokenization of real estate properties on the platform. And we've got an M&A advisory role uh, uh, to represent them to, to sell the business. So. Hopefully, in the next two to three weeks, you'll start hearing some big news about, about that. So that kind of brings us up to date. And what we're here to really talk about is this tokenization thing. Uh, if anybody's been watching the financial media recently, you've been seeing this guy, Larry Fink, who's the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world. Manage over, I think, $10 trillion in assets with a T, trillion with a T. Uh, and he was on Bloomberg after they launched their Bitcoin ETF. Uh, has, has anybody seen like all the ETFs and stuff happening? Uh, it's been pretty, pretty exciting in our space. But um, he, he described the ETF thing. That's they're, they're really kind of securitizing digital assets. And then the next step, he said, is that they're going to tokenize every financial asset, every stock, every bond. Um, and you know, when you've got the leading asset manager in the world basically telling you that, you know that it's probably going to happen. Uh, Alicia Haas, who's the CFO of Coinbase, when she testified before Congress sometime last year, uh, she was quoted saying, you know, just explaining to these politicians, you guys need to understand that anything of value can be tokenized. So that's what we're really talking about is the, is the internet of value. So what is this kind of moment in time of going into to tokenization? It's, it's to me representing, representing a, a paradigm shift called the digital shift of moving from you know, physical paper assets to having those be digitally recorded on an immutable blockchain. Uh, and these, these are decentralized, or that's the buzzword in the industry, or distributed ledgers. So they don't exist, like it's not like the general ledger that exists at Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America. These are distributed on nodes all over the world. And it's kind of like you've got a thousand auditors or more looking at each and every transaction and verifying that yes, that in fact is a truthful transaction and should be recorded to the blockchain. Uh, and this will end up increasing accessibility to all kinds of people all over the world, to the financial system. There's, um, I think it's estimated that it's one and a half to two billion people in the world of only seven and a half to eight billion people are not part of the banking system. They're completely outside the system. Uh, and you know, this technology and the way, um, uh, the way uh, Wi-Fi technology is, is, is starting to expand around the world 
we're going to be able to bring those people into the banking system. A lot of people think, uh, I don't think anybody in this room would think this, but a lot of people think that, that tokenizing an asset onto the blockchain means that you somehow take a piece of gold or a barrel of oil and somehow transmute it into digital and push it into and onto the blockchain. That's obviously not what hap what's happening. Tokenization <coughs> is the process of taking what it means to own an asset, uh, the rights to own the asset, and, and putting those into a form in storing. So think now how you've got like a certificate of title for your car, or there's a deed to your house, or you got a stock certificate that's your ownership claim on a, on a, uh, on a share of stock. Tokenization is basically like those things in the paper world, but being stored on, on the blockchain. So that's that's the process of, of what we're going through. And so those rights, um, when you take property, and, and like, anybody think about going to law school after this? One poor soul. <laughs> uh, so in your first year property class, you're going you're to learn about the bundle of sticks. Property and ownership is a bundle of sticks. What, what they mean by that, it's a whole bunch of rights, each one of which is, is a stick in your bundle of what it means to own. So you've got like the right to possess. You've got the right to uh, transfer control, the right of quiet enjoyment. There's all these different rights that are in your bundle. And like when you lease your property that you own, you're basically giving that right of possession, that one stick, out to somebody. So. Those are the rights that we're going to be programming in to these smart contracts and, and, and incorporating into these tokens. Some of the benefits of asset tokenization, of course, uh, it's going to enhance liquidity. Um, when, you, when you're able to fractionalize the ownership of an asset and make it available to basically any other person who is able to operate with you digitally, in the world, you're, you're dramatically enhancing the liquidity of, of your asset. The costs, as I mentioned before, are dramatically lower, notably because the middlemen are going to start to disappear as this becomes more and more adopted. Um, I just sent a wire, Bank of America, uh, to uh, a, a, a counterparty two days ago. And I needed to send it same day, and it cost me $30. So 2024, to send same day money from a regular bank cost you $30. Okay, I could have sent that person a digital asset. They have had it in three to five seconds, and it would cost me a fraction of a penny, no matter kind of what the amount is. So the, the participation in our financial system, just from that issue alone, of the cost going down, is going to be it's going to it's going to facilitate cross-border and open up the entire globe to transacting with assets that are not in the jurisdictions in which they live. So right now, um, the United States is woefully behind in regulating digital assets, and therefore has slowed down dramatically the adoption of digital assets in our country. Other countries are not that way. Uh, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, they have been embracing this, uh, they're, they're like a decade ahead, at least, of embracing this technology, creating a regulatory environment to encourage the adoption and use of this technology. But most of the assets that the people overseas want to own are U.S. assets. They would really like to own a lot of cash flowing, cash flowing uh, real estate assets. Well, this is something that will allow them to make investments in U.S. cash flowing assets, but have that ownership transferred to them, as I said, in three to five seconds. So it's going to create a new global demand for assets that will be going in all different directions. Uh, increased security. I know Dr. Warren's challenged me on this one, but uh, because of encryption technology and the things that are inherent into the blockchain, um, we believe with the current state of computing, I think you got a point, when we get into the quantum quantum computing and AI is truly prevalent, um, that maybe there will be challenges to security, and I think will evolve 
But for now, it is one of the most secure ways that you can store information or report value. Talk about instant settlement, uh, automated, uh, automated processes. So, you know, right now in business, when you enter into contracts, um, the other parties don't perform all the time, or there's human error that, that gets put into the system. Uh, and if you can be, be programming the performance, you know, the conditions, and then when these conditions are satisfied, these certain events are going to happen, uh, you can really uh, automate a lot of what happens in, in business. So that's a more efficient thing. 24-7 accessibility, this is, this is going to be huge. Okay, so right now, the markets, the stock markets are open from 9.30 to 4. Okay, so that's six and a half hours. I did this math. Six and a half hours for five days a week and say that we are in business about, true business, about 50 weeks of the year. That's 1,625 trading hours every year, okay? When you go to a 24-7 transactional environment, that is going to amount to, in the same 50 weeks, we're not going to increase the amount, so we get, still get to have Christmas and vacation and whatever that stuff, right? So the 24 hours, seven days a week, times 50 weeks, that's 8,400 trading hours. So just the trading hours, the time to be in business, and open for business is going to over 5x just from the hours. Then you start thinking about the internal efficiencies that this technology is going to, to drive, where you know sometimes those transactions in the 1,625 hours, they took five hours, maybe some didn't settle to the next day, maybe some took several days to settle. They start having this instantaneous settlement kind of internally within each of those trading hours it's more efficient just because you're using the technology. This is a quantum explosion in, um, in kind of usage and the way we move value that we haven't even fully began to appreciate, but it's going to be pretty massive. Which brings us this thing called Javon's Paradox. Um, Javon was an economist in the 1860s. And he noted, uh, it, when, when looking at uh, these improvements in coal efficiency, that in actuality, even though the costs were going down, the usage ended up going up because there were other industries that started to find ways to use coal since it was so much cheaper than it had been because of this technological advancement. So he basically acknowledged this existence of a, of a phenomenon that technological advancement that dramatically reduces cost, as blockchain and tokenization certainly will, um, doesn't necessarily lead to kind of less usage or anything like that. It's quite the opposite. When demand is variable, there will be an explosion in other use cases that we haven't even gotten to think about. We'll start to apply this technological advantage. So the whole world will be tokenized. That's probably my message of the day. The whole world's going to be. Larry Fink's telling you. C CFO of Coinbase telling you. Jimmy Valley's here tonight. The whole world's going to be tokenized. We've embarked on what I call a generational tokenization project, which isn't that much different when you think about it. Um, right around the time that I was at Lamar, we were really starting to, to get into taking paper and digitizing paper. In fact, um, the very first e-filing business in the country was based right here in Beaumont. It's a company called Law Plus, and uh, Judge Mahaffey in Beaumont basically kind of stewarded that, took it under his wing, and allowed people to start e-filing their pleadings and things of that nature. Uh, when I was at Texas Tech, we actually had Judge Mahaffey come and talk about that. And, now, e-filing is required pretty much in every court um, in, in the country. When we did our amicus <coughs> brief, we e-filed it, right? So this is a very similar type of project that's going to occur where we'll have to you know, be working with developers and accounting professionals and business people and just everybody in the business landscape and the software engineering landscape to start moving all these assets into tokenized form. And it's going to be everything. Gold, precious metals, oil, gas, real estate's going to be huge. 
you said you were already doing some stuff on that. That was super cool. Securities is the biggest. I mean, Larry, Larry Fink's telling you the truth. Securities are like tailor-made to be programmed. They're all basically if-then statements in contracts. Take it from someone who's looked at a lot of these contracts. Um, the other th art and music. We, the NFT you know, phase kind of even led where we're going into now with tokenization. So um, all things will be, will be tokenized. And to give you a perspective of what that means, I refer back to our evaluation report that we did. When you go to you know, do something like that, you got to try to wrap your arms around what is all the money? What's all the value? Uh, and we worked very hard on this for a number of months. And our best conclusion, call this really end of 22, first quarter of 23, was that all the money is about $5.3 quadrillion. So that's every, every asset, derivatives, private wealth, real estate, debt, everything that you can think of. I love saying quadrillion because it's kind of like that Dr. Evil from Austin Penn. Like, quadrillion dollars. Uh, it's just a really big number, right? Um, the truth is, though, uh, you know, as was pointed out here, we've almost daily now, uh, we learn about some multi-trillion dollar thing that we never knew about before. Like the Bank of the International Settlements uh, last year disclosed that there were off balance sheets, forex swaps that were about $80 trillion that they didn't even really know about. $80 trillion. Oh, hello. There's, you know, clandestine defense programs, got $180 trillion in unfunded liabilities in the United States alone, $95 trillion Department of Defense. So this stuff isn't even really included up in the 5.3 quadrillion. You know, there, there's just a whole bunch of things that exist in the world of value that aren't kind of, you know, there is no like global auditor right now that's going out and saying, you know, let me look at everything that exists and make sure that we capture, capture it all. So we really don't know. There's a cool infographic you guys should check out. It's called, uh, the company who did it, it's called Visual Capitalist, it's online. If you just search visual capitalist infographic, you'll come up with, with a lot of stuff, but they basically take these blocks and show you in visual form with what all the money looks like. It's pretty, pretty interesting. So as I mentioned before, the major impediments um, to full-on adoption in our country have been kind of legal and regulatory. Uh, it's, it's very nebulous right now how each of these types of assets are treated. Is it a security or is it a commodity? Or is it you know, some money transmission payment system network thing? Each of those would, could bring dramatically different regulatory consequences based on, uh, on how it's treated. Another big development is that several states have been adopting an amendment to the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, there's a new Article 12. You guys should check, check into this if you haven't heard about this, but the, the article covers uh, controllable electronic records, CERs, which are basically digital assets and anything else that you can possess or control uh, in digital form. So think like airline miles, and loyalty points, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'll talk in a second, I'll go back to that in just a second and mention something. Uh, and then we believe, and we're large proponents of, we talked a little bit about this at launch, that there's a pretty significant need for capital markets reform um, to allow, certainly when we've got the ability to transact peer-to-peer -peer with any other person that effectively has a digital wallet anywhere in the world, uh, we need to have a system in place, regulatorily speaking, that allows as many people to participate in the global economic system as possible. So I'll mention a couple of things on that. Uh, notable thing in, in um, Article 12 uh, is called the Take Free Rule. And uh, this was based on something that was already in the Uniform Commercial Code, but it's the concept of a holder in due course which ties to negotiable instruments. Uh, and it's basically 
the concept of, uh, you know, Don and I engage in a transaction, you know, and I write him a check, and then he gives it to, to Josh and endorses it, and Josh gives him money for that. He gives him something of value. Josh is in a, a capacity that we refer to in the law as a holder in due course, which means that when Don figures out that the car, when I figure out that the car Don sold me is a lemon, and I got to make a claim that you defrauded me out of my money, I won't be able to go after Josh because Josh actually unknowingly to that paid value for that negotiable instrument. So now we're in this digital world, you know, this quantum, you know, software units going back and forth in, in light speed, and um, we're going to have what's called this, this take-free rule, which is kind of the same setup, you know, if uh, Josh pays value to Don for some digital assets and he's unknown, he's unaware of my claim, then he can take that digital assets free, free of a claim. And I'll tell you a real, real world uh, application of how this could be working. Uh, when uh, there's, a, there's a token out there called Songbird that was airdropped to all XRP holders through the XRPL. It was airdropped, let's say early, the snapshot was taken for the airdrop in I think December of 2020. And it was airdropped initially, call it in the six months after that, that snapshot. Uh, Coinbase never distributed the Songbird. They, or they have done some now, but they basically just took the Songbird that was supposed to go to all their customers who had been participated in the snapshot, and they just held it. Now, if Coinbase has sold that Songbird token to a third party who's unaware, uh, of potential XRP token holders' claims against that songbird, then this take-free rule would apply. And it's going to really start to show up in things like decentralized finance, we call DeFi and stuff like that, um, where you know people's defenses that they may or ordinarily have to claw back their assets are not going to exist because they've already been transferred to another party who had no knowledge. Fortunately, most of the statutes that are getting adopted kind of have, it's, it's not that you just don't know, it's also kind of, there wasn't any evidence out there that you kind of should have known. So, in the Songbird example, I think we could still go after Josh and claw back our Songbird. Sorry, but uh, you understand, we want Songbird. Uh, but um, if, if there's other cases that aren't as, as publicized as that, you know, that, that could be a real, real issue. So capital markets reform. You know, we believe at our firm that free and open access to the capital markets is essential to living in a free society. And right now, the private markets have been kind of locked out of people who don't, they're not able to pass what's called a wealth test. You don't have a certain amount of wealth or you don't make a certain amount. In a, um, in a year, uh, you're kind of foreclosed from participating uh, in, in the private markets. Most transactions and investment opportunities of this day and age, certainly when you start looking at startups and things like that, happen in the private marketplace. They're not going through a registration process with the SEC and having those securities traded publicly. So that's, that's a big problem for us because it doesn't make any sense to me that someone could go to a casino and take their entire life savings and put it on black or red for one roll of the, one spin of the roulette wheel and lose it all, and no one would care, you know? So why are we locking people out of doing, you know, a path to do something very positive for their lives and make investments that could help grow their wealth and lift them up out of poverty, lift up humanity in the process? So, one of the big things that we're a proponent of is uh, last year, the House of Representatives passed, uh, it has not been approved by the Senate, but the House of Representatives passed a bill uh, directing the SEC to come up with what's called an accredited investor exam. So this is kind of like prove your sophistication type of thing, but it's something that no matter what your wealth status is, you could learn some things, you could take a class at Lamar University. 
and learn a couple of things about you know what it means to participate in the capital markets, what the risks are, how to read financial statements, all that kind of stuff that you need to be a, a, a good investor or a prudent investor. And if you pass that exam, then you could participate in these, these private capital markets as if you were accredited. Um, we believe that there needs to be a pretty fundamental re-examination of how um, periodic reporting is done in, in, the, in the securities markets. Uh, right now, I don't know if anybody's pulled up a company's 10K or 10Q recently and started to like read through this thing, but it's it, it's like the most laborious, you know, thing you're ever going to look at. It's very encyclopedic, and a lot of it has nothing to do with your investment decision. And it's actually been weaponized by the securities bar, in my opinion, um, to kind of confuse people and, and keep them out, or waive liabilities that maybe should otherwise occur. So, you know, my example is like, you know, there's a disclaimer or a risk factor that says, it is possible, although not likely, that a meteor very large could strike the earth and if a meteor struck the earth, we may suffer a material loss on this year's financials. I mean, that's just kind of like waving, you know, everything that could possibly happen, right? So we believe in plain English disclosures. We think that you could take these, you know, filings from 100 and some pages down to 20 pages. And, and so that's, that's part of what we, we think needs to happen as well. Uh, digital asset securities regulation. So both Congress and the SEC have effectively done nothing to try to regulate the digital asset sector. And uh, you know, they, they bring up the chairman of the SEC all the time. He basically does this, you know, nothing happens. Six months a year go by. Uh, and this isn't really that hard. We've actually got a lot of existing securities regulations in, in place that could be pretty easily applied to digital assets, uh, and we need to kind of get on with it. I want to give a shout out to uh, Commissioner Hester Purse. She proposed, she's done it twice, but more recently, I think it was 2021, uh, she's got something called the Token Safe Harbor Proposal, which to me is just a common sense proposal. And it's basically like if you're uh, a development company, you're developing this new network, this new technology, uh, you should have some period of time to um, invest in that and, and take in private investment in that and see if you can get the network to be adopted more, you know, more predominantly. And if it is something that is truly good for humanity, you think people will be using it and it will be adopted. Uh, and she says if, if, if it happens that way within this three year safe harbor period, then they won't have to at the end of the three years file a S-1 registration statement and be registered or, or regulated under the securities laws, which have holding periods and all kinds of stuff. Um, it really shouldn't be applicable, in my opinion, to most digital assets. So I, I think we need to adopt uh, Hester Purse's token safe harbor proposal. Now all of this, you know, streamlining the Disclosure requirements, adopting you know these proposals. If if fraud can still run rampant, you know you can have like what happened with FTX uh, and what's happened with Celsius and Luna. And, I mean, there's quite a quite a bit of dead bodies right now in, in the digital asset sector of you know token projects that were effectively scams. They had no utility. They were you know pushed through the media as being the next great thing. And then you know the, the insiders are dumping on retail all the time, and, you know, and people end up losing a lot of money. We need to have, again, from our perspective, more strength and penalties for that type of fraud. You know, when you when you're when you're doing the you know the Enron, FTX level fraud that is catastrophic, that wipes out billions of dollars in value. Um, you should be looking at something like maximum of life imprisonment or something of that nature because that's the only way you're going to deter people from doing what seems to just keep happening in our, our financial markets. Last thing 
is we believe that we need to reform the SEC and have some better regulatory uh, application of Congress. Congress is effectively allowed now, if you're a member of Congress, you're allowed to engage in insider trading based on in inside information you learn in Congress. Um, Nancy Pelosi is someone who's famous for this. There's actually uh, people who've started funds that track what Nancy Pelosi's trades are, and they do quite well. Uh, her timing is, is pretty, pretty amazing. They've already started talking about passing this type of legislation, um, but there really needs to be, that needs to be ranked in. Um, and then, you know, the, these regulators that have what's kind of a revolving door Especially at the SEC, where you know um, I mentioned earlier how they had brought in the action against Ripple, and then the chairman of the SEC leaves the next day. He immediately, initially, stops at his old law firm. He becomes the then chairman of Apollo, and he becomes uh, on the board of a hedge fund called One River. One River, two months before the Ripple lawsuit, had made a billion-dollar investment in Bitcoin and Ethereum. And when the Ripple lawsuit happened, they profited very well from doing that. That type of activity should really not be permitted. We've got to figure out how to, how to really bring that in. So, uh, if you want a copy of these slides, you could you could go to this uh, you know, www.valgoadvisors.io backslash Lamar, or you could hit the uh, QR code, and we will uh, we'll send you those. You can be followed on uh, Twitter, now X, and LinkedIn. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if we got time. We act, actually, uh, we went over time. Yes, because yeah. classes, some of these people may have classes at two. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, thank you for your attention. We're